Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. I apologize for the slightly late start, um, dealing with a few little technological glitches, but we should be good to go. Um, my name is Kara Vincent, and I'm the Knowledge Translator at SIPSERT. Thank you for joining us to, for today's discussion, Developing a Post-Pandemic Model of Cultural Competency for Healthcare Providers and Public Safety Personnel. Hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. It seems that Kara might be frozen. Um, my name is Carrie Lynn, and I'm also a knowledge translator here at SIPSERT. I apologize. Um, I hope you can hear me. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so, uh, when till Kara maybe sorts herself out, let um, I'll share my screen, Kim, and maybe we can start. Uh, with your presentation, if that's all right. Absolutely, yes. You can hear me okay? okay? Let's do it. Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Great. Just give me a moment. Okay. Can you see the slides, Kim? Is that all right? Yes. Okay, great. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much. And um, so my name is Kim Ritchie and I am an assistant professor at Trent University. And I also um, work as a research associate um, through the Trauma and Recovery Lab at McMaster University. And um, I'll be speaking about our project today um, that in which we developed a cultural competency framework to address the mental health needs of healthcare providers and public safety personnel in Canada. Next slide. I'd, I'd like to start this presentation by really um, acknowledging this a very large um, group of our team from both McMaster University and Homewood Health Centre, who we collectively um, work together to bring this uh, project forward. Uh, and these individuals um, dedicated a lot of time and a lot of expertise uh, to this project. As we know, both healthcare providers and public safety personnel served on the front line during the pandemic, and they really faced a lot of new and unprecedented levels of work-related stress, which have been attributed to the extraordinary events that occurred during the pandemic. And if we just take a moment to step back and uh, recall that at the very beginning of the pandemic, these both professions on the front lines really faced a lot of uncertainty about virus transmission. And one of the things that they were really fearful about was contracting the virus themselves, but even more fearful about transmitting it to their families and friends. 
They also faced a, a number of new moral dilemmas or amplified in the um, severity of these moral dilemmas, such as for healthcare providers, it was having to allocate uh, life-saving resources. And for public safety personnel, it was having to enforce controversial stay-at-home orders or vaccine policies. Both professions really endured severe shortings, staffing shortages and increased workloads that we know have only worsened over the course of the pandemic and into this post-pandemic period where we're now seeing um, a large number of individuals from both professions leaving due to the ongoing stress and workload challenges. And these circumstances have all contributed to the increased toll on their mental health. And in the literature, we're now seeing also high rates of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So early in 2021, our team uh, in the Trauma and Recovery Research Unit at McMaster started collecting data, and we learned about these devastating impacts of the pandemic on the mental health of healthcare workers, and, uh, and a little bit later on public safety personnel. Uh, through generous support from Homewood Health Incorporated, we decided to collectively develop an evidence-informed treatment program to address the mental health needs of uh, healthcare providers and public safety personnel. So we really had two goals for this project, and they were to understand the lived experience and mental health impacts of the pandemic on healthcare providers and public safety personnel. And the second goal was then to develop a novel uh, approach to a mental health treatment uh, or assessment prevention and treatment program to address the mental health needs of both professions during and after the pandemic. So we recruited both healthcare providers and public safety personnel from across Canada. And uh, public safety personnel uh, were firefighters, paramedics, police officers, correctional workers, border patrol service workers, and um, public safety communicators. And for healthcare providers, we recruited uh, those involved in direct care, so uh, such as a nurse, a respiratory therapist, personal support workers, and physicians. We also recruited indirect care providers, such as environmental services and leadership and administration within healthcare facilities. Um, participants had the option to complete either a survey only, so it was an online survey administered via a red cap, or they could participate in a survey and a semi-structured virtual interview, which we conducted over Zoom. So uh, just briefly to give you a sense of some of the findings of our surveys, uh, for the public safety personnel, in total, we had 681 uh, complete our surveys. The majority were paramedics at 38% of our total sample, 21% were firefighters, 13% were police officers, and smaller numbers of correctional workers and public safety communicators. 64% were male, and about half were from Ontario. We also had 21% from Alberta and smaller numbers from the remaining provinces in Canada. Age was fairly evenly distributed um, across each decade with about 50% of participants under 40 years of age and 50% over the age of 40. So looking more specifically at mental health, um, what we found is using the PCL5, which measures uh, um, which is a screening tool for PTSD, we found over 38% of public safety personnel met the cutoff for probable PTSD. And they also showed substantial levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. 77% um, showed clinically significant levels of depression, 76% for anxiety, and 53% for stress. One of the other measures that we used looked was an outcome measure for moral injury. And in that uh, measure, there are two subscales, one that looks at shame related outcomes and one that looks at trust violation rated, related outcomes. And it, um, there's a few examples of the types of questions on the measure on the slide here to give you a sense of the differences between these two subscales. And you can see clearly that the uh, 
results showed that participants had much higher trust-related outcomes than shame-related outcomes. And so this, the trust-related outcomes are tend to be associated with the feelings of betrayal by an organization or a trusted authority versus the shame-related outcomes, which are more, I've done something or I've witnessed something um, that, I, that transgresses my moral values. We also asked uh, participants about their intention to leave both their organization and their profession. And on this slide here, you can see that just over one in two or 53% of public safety personnel reported that they were 50% or more likely to leave their organization. And about 40% were 50% or more likely to leave their profession. And we know from, um, some of the prior work in this area that the the individuals that intend to leave their organization or profession about a third of them actually do so these are fairly high numbers when you think about the number of people leaving so turning now to healthcare providers uh, we had uh, just over 1100 surveys completed um, about 39 percent the majority of the sample were nurses uh, 24 percent were respiratory therapists and smaller numbers of physicians occupational therapists personal support workers um, physiotherapists and others you can see on the slide 89 percent were female and again just over half or 59 percent were from ontario we also had uh, 11 percent each from bc and alberta and smaller numbers from the remaining provinces and territories in canada um, the healthcare providers were slightly younger, 67% were under the age of 40. And looking at the mental health, um, very similar to what we saw in the public safety personnel, 34% of healthcare providers met the cutoff for probable PTSD, and they also showed significant um, uh, levels of depression, anxiety and stress on the scales. 73% reported clinically significant levels of depression, 80% for anxiety, and 56 for stress. And very similar again for moral injury um, to public safety personnel where healthcare providers showed greater trust violations, or these are the betrayal, um, feeling betrayed by somebody in comparison to the shame related uh, outcomes. And again, very, very similar in terms of the intention to leave. One in two or 53% of healthcare providers were 50% or more likely to leave their organization and 40% more likely to leave their profession. So you can see from these slides that uh, both healthcare providers and public safety personnel, very similar in terms of the degree and the severity of mental health um, impacts that they're experiencing, and also these really high numbers of intending to leave both their organizations and professions. So clearly the need for ongoing mental health uh, supports. So we also um, conducted semi-structured interviews with 39 public safety personnel and 91 healthcare providers. And one of the questions we asked participants was if they were to seek out mental health treatment for themselves, what would they want their mental health clinician to know about or to do for them? And almost all the participants that we spoke to responded to this question in the same way. First, they said they wanted them to have an in-depth understanding of the type of work that they did and the type of environment they, they worked in. So a sense of sort of what their day looked like and the types of challenges that they faced throughout their days. Um, they also wanted them to have an, a sense of what were the types of traumatic and difficult and morally difficult uh, and challenging situations that they had seen during the pandemic. Because as we know, this was a really extraordinary time for both professions and um, both of these professions were on the front lines and their experience was very different than what other occupations were uh, during the pandemic. Some participants talked about being in an entirely different world and feeling like they were in an entirely different world in the pandemic compared to other occupations um, and, and even 
coming home, they felt like their work world was completely separate from their home world. Um, and some participants even phrased it that way as they said they wanted their mental health clinicians to be able to be in their world in order to be able to understand what it was like to be uh, working during the pandemic. And part of this was that they wanted their mental health clinicians to be comfortable talking about these very um, challenging and sometimes very traumatic situations that they had been exposed to or involved in. And it was important to them that they knew about these situations ahead of time so that they didn't react with being shocked or even um, they were concerned about traumatizing somebody else by sharing these stories of things that they had been involved in during the pandemic or in, in, in the work. So this going into this project where we were going to develop a treatment program uh, for mental health clinicians um, to be able to um, help both healthcare providers and public safety personnel, we knew we would have to give the mental health clinicians a little bit of information about what it was like for them on the front lines. But we were really surprised by the knowledge that this was consistently identified throughout our interviews as the most important aspect of having successful mental health treatment by both healthcare providers and public safety personnel. And we really felt this was a key finding in our qualitative data. And that really led us to understand that both healthcare providers and public safety personnel could really be considered to have their own cultural aspects, which are defined by these occupational experiences that they had uh, during the pandemic and that they were different than a lot of other types of occupations. So based on this evidence, uh, we decided to go ahead and develop a, a cultural competency education program for mental health clinicians in addition to the treatment program. So we had sort of two, um, two things that we were developing at the same time. And so far, we have developed the program for healthcare providers, and I'll be sharing uh, this today. And we're currently working on uh, something similar for public safety personnel now. Next slide. Thank you. So um, before I, we talk about the educational program, I thought it'd be helpful just to uh, frame a few slides around cultural competence. And so most of the previous research on cultural competency has been on more traditional definitions of culture, such as ethnicity. And there's also been some research on cultural competency for military veterans and their families. In a nutshell, what cultural competence is, is really about improving care by integrating culture into the delivery of healthcare services. And there's many different definitions of cultural competence, but one of the pioneers um, in this field define, uh, developed this definition on the screen in 2002. And she said cultural competence is an ongoing process in which the healthcare provider continuously strives to achieve the ability to effectively work within the cultural context of the client. And I think this is really one of the um, important aspects of this definition is that it's cultural competency is a continual process. So there's no actual end point. It's not about that you become culturally competent, it's rather that you're becoming and that this is a lifelong, it's continuous without a defined end point. And the other definition on the screen there uh, was in a statement by Watson, and I think that's another way uh, that's useful to characterize a cultural competence, that it's to care for someone, I must know who I am, to care for someone, I must know who the other is, to care for someone, I must be able to bridge the gap between myself and the other. And I think this definition also provides one of the core elements in that it's not just about knowing about another culture, but involves uh, a lot of self-reflection where you think about your own culture, your own values in order to raise your awareness and sensitivity to cultural differences and to understand that you're in a place of not knowing or that you is about understanding somebody else's view that goes beyond just giving knowledge. 
And so we decided to frame this educational training um, for the mental health clinicians under this umbrella of a cultural competency framework because we felt that these unique shared experiences of healthcare providers and public safety personnel really um, define them within this their own culture that they experienced during the pandemic because of their occupations. Next slide. So just a few more um, uh, aspects of cultural competence. Within cultural competence, there are dimensions or domains, and there's usually three of them. The first is cultural awareness, which is the process of becoming respectful, appreciative, and sensitive to the values, beliefs, and practices of another culture. And this is the part that involves a lot of self-evaluation and self um, a reflection or in order to build an understanding that others don't necessarily share the same worldview or perspective that you do and it's about trying to understand somebody else's worldview and perspective cultural knowledge is the process of seeking and obtaining um, educational foundation about the worldview and of different cultures and so this is the a sense of you know finding more concrete knowledge to be able to um, understand what are the values, what is it like to be in that culture, what are the defining pieces of that culture that you can actually intentionally seek out by looking for knowledge about that culture. And then the last one is cultural skill. And this is more the ability to communicate in a culturally relevant way or to conduct a culturally appropriate assessment and, uh, and also to um, provide culturally appropriate interventions. Studies have also looked at what are uh, components of cultural competency training or education that are deemed to be um, a deemed to be part of most the most effective type of cultural competency education. And I've listed three uh, key components here. The first one is that um, it's more than just giving knowledge and so it goes beyond sort of passive learning and taking in knowledge into more active uh, and active learning and engagement with the material so it's really about trying to create ways to engage and cause that reflect self-reflection which is a key component of becoming more culturally um, uh, competent so a number of studies recommend that part of this act of learning is the ability to engage in some scenario based training or case studies um, with ongoing discussions and stories, rather than uh, just to read something or to to um, uh, engage with a module and just passively receive it It's more about in, uh, active engagement. The second component is uh, that it's not just a one-time event, but involves a period of continuous learning over time. And this continuous learning is done through repetition, uh, where there could be ongoing series of training, there could be ongoing team discussions, and it allows an individual to be able to practice something over a period of time. And again, this goes back to the original definitions where there's no actual endpoint. This is about continuous learning. And then the third one, uh, involves the content of the program itself is that it's evidence-based derived from research or theoretical knowledge and that there is an opportunity for ongoing supervision or case consultation and again that's to reflect this continuing learning component. So before I go on to talk about the, the program we developed, I just uh, thought it would be useful to just highlight one current um, issue or debate that's in the literature right now about cultural competency and cultural humility. And there's been a number of criticisms of cultural competence in recent years, and they really center around two main issues that we've hit on already. The first one is the use of the term competent is very misleading in that it assumes that there is this endpoint um, and that cultural competency is just about knowledge acquisition. The other criticism is that it has a very, it does have a very uh, strong top-down approach 
So there is a focus on knowledge acquisition in addition to the uh, reflection through uh, developing awareness. But there's also a piece that fails to uh, acknowledge or recognize some of the underlying uh, social justice issues in institutional processes, which can also um, perpetuate some difficulties uh, in, uh, in impacts among different cultural differences. In comparison, the cultural humility emerged later in the 1990s and has really been seen as opposing or an alternative approach to cultural competency. It's considered more of a bottom up process where there's a less focus on knowledge and it's more about learning about another culture in a relational way with another person or group. And so what cultural humility requires more of this other stance where you're open to understanding about another person's worldview rather than more knowledge driven approaches. There's also a number of criticisms about cultural humility in that it, it lacks any sort of focus on just um, learning through um, to acquire knowledge about another culture, which is also considered to be necessary in order to develop an under understanding. And even more recently, a number of authors have suggested that it's not so much of cultural competence or cultural humility, but it's more of a both and situation and that they're really not in opposition to each other, but rather more synergistic and complementary. And some authors have even suggested that cultural humility is part of the process of becoming culturally competent, where this openness and other stance which is part of cultural humility is really also a necessary part of um, of cultural competence and th towards understanding another uh, culture or person. At the same time, it recognizes the value within learning and acquiring knowledge to increase understanding. So this quote here, uh, which is in a recent article, I thought really sort of summed up about how these two concepts can be complementary. Um, and it says, I accept cultural humility to be the ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that is other oriented or open to others while accepting cultural competence as the ability to interact effectively with people of different cultures, more of a learned taught condition. I pride myself in the ability to claim both competence and humility, recognizing both as a lifelong journey without an end point. So this was the idea that we took forward when we developed this program. And this is how we've, we've sort of conceptualized and integrated both of these concepts into um, our project. So now I'll turn to the healthcare provider cultural competency framework that we developed and the uh, educational program. Uh, we began with uh, the healthcare provider program, um, and we, we the first step that we did was that we formed a working group with members of the team from both McMaster and from Homewood. And having this collaborative approach was really one of the most valuable parts of this process, as we were able to simultaneously develop the cultural competency program and also tailor it to the organization at the same time because we had both parties at the table and this really ultimately saved us a lot of time because we were able to collect data rapidly translated into a real world clinical setting it also allowed us to understand from the very beginning very practical and technical issues that are sometimes found out at the very end and and one of those was what type of learning platform are they using so that we could, from the very beginning, we could format our education to be compatible with their learning platform without having to try to modify it after the fact. When we developed this, we used um, a cultural competency modeling approach or a competency modeling approach developed by Morelli et al. And we first analyzed the interview data to identify the competencies and then we clustered the competencies together and defined them further so that they could be operationalized into the actual education program. Next slide. So this slide shows uh, very briefly, and this is just a small part of a very large uh, document, 
where we develop the cultural competency framework. And you can see here that through our data analysis, we sorted the data into these three competency categories, cultural awareness, cultural knowledge, and cultural skill. And then we clustered these through our, the rest of our data analysis into five great bigger thematic areas. And each one addressed one of the key themes we found in our interview data. And we use these key themes as a jumping off point to form the basis for five modules, which we subsequently developed. So each module that we developed, um, each one of these five comprised its own module uh, that was developed for the mental health clinicians to explain, um, to try to uh, provide education about the, uh, the pandemic and integrating all of the cultural awareness, knowledge, and skills within each of these modules. So each module started out with a slide like this one, and you can see here, this is module one, which was on mental health and moral injury. And the slide each, uh, the slides, or the, the educational program began with a video um, by Dr. Margaret McKinnon, and she would introduce the topic area and provide an overview of the entire module. Then we had a number of slides that gave, uh, it was brief, but a comprehensive summary of the topic area. And this information was derived both from the literature and from our qualitative and quantitative data. One of the innovative parts um, of this educational program was that we included short videos of actual healthcare providers describing their own lived experience during the pandemic as it related to this particular, each one of the five themes. And afterwards, following each of these videos, then there was a series of reflection questions in order for the clinician watching this to be able to engage more with the information. Um, next slide. So I've included just a, a few slides coming from each of the module just to give you an idea of what they were like. Um, each of the slides was also available in a narrated format so that the end user could either just read it or if they preferred to play it in terms of an audio format, this gave them some options. And so this one on moral injury, we had a few slides that just gave some um, high level information about what moral injury is um, and to, what are the risk factors for moral injury, what are the outcomes of moral injury, um, in sort of a more uh, knowledge-driven uh, way. Then we had a number of slides that went a little more specific to look at how did the issue around moral injury relate specifically to COVID-19. And so for this one, what we included in here from our own data was what were the types of situations that were identified during the pandemic that were as potentially morally injurious? And then what was the impact of that uh, on the, the mental health of healthcare providers? We also pulled out some specific quotes from our interview data in order to be able to illustrate this theme in a more experiential way. We had a team of voice narrators who then read out each of the quote to give it just a, a bit more of a real, realistic and authentic feel. And I'll play one for you now, just so you can hear it. Hopefully you can hear it. I'm just gonna turn up my volume. Okay. I'd say like the whole COVID experience has been a really emotional roller coaster. Okay, hopefully you could hear that. Was that, could you hear? Yes, Kim. Yep. Thank okay, you. thank you. Yes, so that just gives you a sense of each one of the quotes. You could just click on like that um, and somebody would read it out again, just to kind of bring it a little more alive and more active learning than passive learning. Uh, next slide. Sorry, give me a minute, it's not moving over. No worries. Oh, there we okay. go. Go ahead. And 
Each module, we also had two to three videos uh, lasting about three to four minutes of a healthcare provider describing an actual experience that they had during the pandemic. And we recruited some healthcare providers separate from our research study and uh, to participate in these videos. Um, and this was really intended to give the mental health clinicians the perspective of the healthcare provider talking about the, the challenges that they faced and, um, and what their experience of that was the, and the impacts on their mental health. All of the healthcare providers we recruited asked to have an avatar, so that's what you can see on the screen here, uh, instead, of a fearful, uh, instead of a video, because they were just a, a bit fearful about having their videos shown. Um, and I'll show you just about one minute of this uh, particular model, this particular video. Um, and then in this one, we have a nurse describing a situation uh, during the pandemic that she described as transgressing her moral values. So you'll just hear it and you can see the avatar on the screen. Um, I think that one, like a situation or a, a group of situations that's really been challenging to me morally is the um, visitor policies in that people are alone in the ICU and people are dying alone in the ICU and they aren't like loved ones are coming in on basically a case by case basis and it has to be pleaded to management of this patient is is dying or they're deteriorating and their family isn't here to support them and they're scared both the patient side and on the family side because not only is the patient our patient in situations like that, but the families are our patient as well. And, and we need to support them through whatever's going on with their, their loved one. Okay, so that just gives you a sense of what each video is about. And she goes on to talk about other instances and challenges uh, during the pandemic and what that was like for her to experience that. But it, it definitely gives you a sense, I think, of having the first person uh, share their own story in their own voice. And um, in many of these, you can hear a lot of emotion in the healthcare providers, and they talk about it from a very personal way, um, which the feedback we've gotten so far from this has been really positive, that these stories are very compelling and that they're very impactful, uh, much more than reading these or um, not having somebody experience, uh, talk about it from their own experience. Thank you. After each of the videos, we then had a series of these different types of, of reflection questions. And this was meant for the mental health clinicians to be able to think about their own um, themselves put themselves in the picture um, and to more actively engage with the videos. So a lot of the questions were about to have the mental, mental health clinicians sit back for a moment and just think about what would this healthcare provider be experiencing this moment? What are the thoughts that they might have? What are the feelings that they might have? How this might actually um, impact them uh, in their mental health? And then the second part of the reflection exercise was to then turn this to themselves and say, well, if I was in this situation, how might I think and how much how might I feel to be a part of this? Um, and again, this goes back, we included this going back to the literature that I showed earlier, showing that the most important part was this more active engagement uh, with the information. And then um, each of the videos we, in the three to four videos we showed, we talked about the actual uh, challenges and situations like you saw in the first one, but then we also included some videos talking about the impact of on the mental health. And so this video that I'll show you, um, again, it's only audio format, but this is the same nurse um, who is talking about the impact of these different situations on her mental health. So this one's just a couple minutes long. 
we we deal with a lot of traumatic things in in terms of maybe code blues or cardiac arrest or um, things like that, and they're not necessarily debriefed enough i don't think and maybe other institutions are different but i don't think that they are are debriefed or talked about enough um when they happen um and it's just kind of normalized that it's a very traumatic place and that this trauma is part of the job and it's just part of of what you do as a as a critical care nurse um Also that like in, in the ICU, you're, you're seeing people on, on like the worst days of their lives when they're at their sickest and they're at their, their most vulnerable. Um, and it's like ICU nurses, I think from what I've, from what I've worked and what I've gleaned from other people, like they give everything to their patients and they often have not much left for themselves um and a lot of like i think that it, people don't necessarily have effective coping mechanisms because they've never taken the time or they've never been encouraged to explore them or how they can they can best be kind to themselves um so i think that that's a need that needs to be addressed of like people need to actually take a look at how they can how they're recovering and and what's the best way for each individual person so just encouraging that i guess okay so you can see again um each of the videos just sort of has a different little vignette that we try to curate around some questions we develop for the healthcare providers that we interviewed um, to prompt them to just talk about their story but it was very much their story and we wanted it to be their story um, in order for them to be able to tell it. So the, we did, the questions we provided were really more of a guide. And each one of these um, videos that we did was about an, anywhere from about one hour to about three hours long. And then we divided it into these smaller segments that were then inserted into all of the different modules that we developed to highlight different aspects of giving that more um, lived experience. next slide you can thank you um, again this is just the reflection questions that were after this video um, it gives you a sense of again just the types of um, things that we wanted them to be able to think about in terms of engaging more with the videos to think about what was it like for that healthcare providers but then to reflect back on yourself to say what would it be like if i were in that situation have I ever had a situation in which conflicted with my own moral values and beliefs? And how did I feel in that? Just to be able to take that different perspective. So, uh, so far um, in terms of evaluation of these modules, uh, they've been running now for uh, about a year, I believe. And we've done a, a, a preliminary evaluation um, using pre post uh, survey questionnaires and if I, I've only included the results of just the moral injury module here, uh, but out of 91 mental health clinicians who have uh, taken this, uh, the all five modules so far, they report that they have increased feelings of comp being competent or feeling competent, um, increased knowledge and also increased importance of understanding the topic after completing the modules. So the evaluation is continuing and we're hoping to be able to do some interviews at some point of the mental clinicians just to learn more about what aspects of the modules were the most helpful. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So in summary, um, there was a few key factors that um, we felt made this project a success. And the first was this coming together of this shared vision between the two organizations of McMaster and Homewood. And both were very committed to this project. 
Um, and this was really reinforced through a lot of leadership support who were very present and were really actively involved in moving the project forward. We also had uh, a series of regular weekly team meetings about the project and developed a plan to keep everybody um, up to date and informed. And the way we did that is that we had members of Homewood attend our McMaster uh, core research meetings. And we also had members of McMaster attend the Homewood meetings. And that way we were able to st uh, share information amongst both facilities. The other um, success factor was really identifying uh, some organizational champions very early uh, in the process. And then we, using their feedback, we were able to tailor the educational program that we were developing so that it aligned with the usual format and delivery methods for other types of educational format or educational programs um, so that you know, usual educational programs that are rolled out in the facility, we, we made it so that this was done the exact same way um, from the get go. So that again, it was just became more efficient use of time, but allowed us from the start to be able to form this and not have to remodify it at the end. So thank you very much uh, for having me today to talk about this project and I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm not sure if I'm if uh, there's any um, questions there. I'm not be able to see them on my end. Sorry, Kim. We're just uh, just waiting for a couple of questions uh, more to roll in. We did have one very early on in your presentation. Uh, one of the attendees wanted to know if it was possible to share the DOI for the publication that you were referencing at the uh, at the head of your presentation. Uh, I'm not sure which uh, publication that they were referring to. Maybe if they could just type it in there. We haven't published the this actual project yet, but we're working on that now. Okay. Thanks so much. We will. Uh, anticipate maybe a follow-up clarification question. Um, no, not a problem at all. Um, what uh, key differences do you expect to see in the public safety personnel side? Yeah, that's a great question. And we're, as I said, we're just currently working on that now. Um, I think in terms of key differences, um, I think you know, one of the things that we have learned about is number one, the, the types of situations that were identified as potentially morally injurious were, were different, of course, amongst the public safety personnel than uh, the healthcare providers. So, you know, those types of things are also going to be um, quite different. Um, the One of the other things that we have learned a lot about is the importance of the team um, in public safety personnel. And so that uh, one of the pieces of this is really about trying to understand the importance of the team for uh, in terms of the uh, different public safety personnel occupations and to uh, provide some um, information to the mental health clinicians about what happened during the pandemic. We've heard uh, a little bit about, you know, masking and the vaccines were very challenging uh, for a lot of teams and and caused in some cases some rupture among the teams and I think these are some of the really important aspects that are going to be important to understand about what was it like to work during the pandemic in addition to the incredible workload shortages and the challenges that they faced just being on the front line so there was kind of all of these layers involved 
but we'll know more right. shortly when we get into the data more. Well, thank, thank you for that. Uh, and as a follow-up question, another attendee would like to know uh, when you anticipate having the PSP portion of the learnings developed? Uh, so we're, we, we're just in the process of doing the data analysis now. I would expect by um, fall, we'll have a good sense of what the framework looks like. And from um, the fall onwards, we'll be looking at developing more the educational piece of it. Appreciate it. And uh, are you aware of any similar research projects uh, being undertaken for public servants? Oh, uh, no, I'm not at all. But that's a great question. Um, I'm not I'm not aware of anything like this for public servants. Uh, we will keep our eyes and our ears peeled. Um, and another attendee wants to know um, who and um, I, I guess who is able to access the modules and uh, where might the training be available? So right now, um, the modules are at, at Homewood. Um, they were our collaborative partner that we were working with for this. And um, I, I believe that they're just within the, the institution at this point in time. Um, the other place I can point people to is that we have developed uh, a website for healthcare providers. It's called Healthcare Salute. So it's www.healthcaresalute. And we've developed some similar types of things to this cultural competency, including a number of videos that are on the website. Um, and the videos are uh, actual videos, so they're not just with the avatar. Um, and they can be accessed free of charge. They can be accessed widely by anybody at all. I see. And the, the clinicians that you, uh, you referenced earlier, um, they were all with Homewood or were they across uh, various spectrums? Yeah, so what we ended up developing is we developed an actual uh, intervention or a program for healthcare providers through Homewood. And um, the mental health clinicians at Homewood receive this training in order to be able to come to develop information or to develop cultural competency, working towards becoming more culturally competent about healthcare providers. So this was considered in, it was rolled out simultaneously with the actual treatment program for the mental health clinicians throughout Homewood. Sure thing. Um, and just in respect to everyone's time, this may be the final question. Uh, an attendee wanted to know if there are aspects of the competency model we can perhaps generalize uh, outside of the uh, COVID-19 context. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really great point. You know, and that was brought up uh, many times by both healthcare providers and public safety personnel that, you know, although the these situations were considered in many cases extraordinary and um, you know unprecedented as we've we've come to use that word um, they weren't not all of them were new and a lot of times that these situations and very challenging situations were considered were pre-pandemic and are continuing now in this post-pandemic period but what they said is they were amplified during the pandemic or more frequent during the pandemic. So I think there's a lot of room to generalize these beyond the pandemic. Um, and I think we can learn from them too. Um, maybe they were just highlighted because of these extraordinary situations that came together during the pandemic. But I think, you know, a lot of times they were always present. It's just, now, because they were raised to such a, a, an amplified level that been causing a lot of mental health impacts, now we have the opportunity to actually, you know, understand them better and to address them. Sure, thank you for that. It looks like we might have time for one final question. Uh, in your study, were clinicians immersed into the actual environment of either PSP or healthcare, or was the information gathered strictly from the modules? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, Can you I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. So in your study, were clinicians immersed into the actual environment of either PSP or healthcare, or was the information gathered strictly from the modules? Um, I'm not sure I understand. So the uh, the clinicians, like the, the clinicians themselves who were um, involved with the modules, they, you know, 
they uh, participated in the modules, they took in the modules, but they were also involved in drug care for most of them anyway. So they were involved in the treatment program for healthcare providers, or they were part of the facility where you know they, they may be uh, have interactions with healthcare providers. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I will keep my eyes on the chat to see if uh, anything else comes of that. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank you, uh, Kim, for your uh, presentation, for answering some questions. Uh, there are just a couple of questions that we couldn't quite get uh, around to asking, but if anybody did want to uh, get their question answered, is there a way that uh, attendees can reach you, Kim? Absolutely, yes. I can uh, put my uh, email in the chat, if that's helpful. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, appreciate that. And feel free to message me. Sure thing. And uh, apologies to anybody that was in attendance earlier on in the uh, in the presentation. We were having some technical issues as we uh, resolved the new interface of GoToWebinar. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that everybody knew uh, who you were, Kim. Uh, our presenter, uh, Dr. Kim Ritchie, is an assistant professor in the Trent Fleming School of Nursing and an assistant clinical professor uh, adjunct in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience at McMaster University. Her research focuses on trauma and moral injury in healthcare providers public safety personnel, veterans, and in older adults. She is currently involved in a study exploring the mental health impacts of COVID-19 on healthcare providers and public safety personnel in Canada, uh, which is what we learned about today. Uh, so Dr. Kim Ritchie, uh, thank you once again for uh, sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, if anybody has any uh, follow-up questions for Dr. Ritchie, uh, her email address has been provided in the chat. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you for your time and attention today, those of you in attendance. I uh, hope you have a good, uh, good rest of your day and uh, onward and upward, as they say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank Take you. Care, everybody.